Uh, Minchi is an assistant professor of economics at the University of Utah. Uh, he was a political prisoner in China in the early 1990s, although I haven't been able to pry any more information about that. Uh, but maybe you can in the question period. Uh, his doctorate is, from, uh, is in economics from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He taught at York University in uh, uh, Ontario, Canada. Uh, 2003 to 2006, political science, interestingly enough. Uh, and since then, he's been at the University of Utah uh, in Salt Lake City. And his book, From Pluto and Monthly Review, uh, is called, which was published in 2009, 2008 and, and 2009, is called The Rise of China and the Demise of the Capitalist World Economy. Oh, there's all that information. It's right there. So you can have it. Uh, so I won't spend any more uh, any more time on introductions. I'll turn it over to Minchi so that we have ample time to talk and uh, discuss afterwards. Thank you very much, David. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's great, with great pleasure. We have great forum. And since I moved to Utah for many years, I've now been back to East Coast, and uh, it's great to see the New York City again. All right. So. Basically, what I want to talk about today, of course, everyone knows right now that global capitalism is in a crisis. But the question is, what is likely to come out of this crisis? And as a result of this crisis, and how will it in turn have influence on the future direction of global economic, political, and social development? Uh, can we just have the next slide? Okay, if we look at this graph, which basically shows the annual rate of growth of the global economy from 1950 until now, now you can see that back to the 1950s and 1960s during the so-called golden age of global capitalism. That was a period when the global capitalism experienced relatively rapid rate of growth when the economic growth rate for the world economy vary between 4 to 6 percent. Now, after the 1970s, the global economy entered into a period of relatively slow growth. And so during the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, the world income growth rates was somewhere between 2 percent and 4 percent. And in some years, for example, in the mid-1970s, and in the early 1980s and early 1990s, when global income growth rate fell below 2% a year, in that period of time, it was known as very deep global recessions. Now, after 2000, especially after about 2003, world the economy experienced a period of relatively rapid growth, uh, largely because of the so-called rise of China, China's rapid economic growth, and so that from 2004 to 2007, world economy grew at rates close to 4% a year. That continued until the breaking out of the current crisis. Now, based on the current estimate this year, world economy as a whole is expected to contract in absolute term by 1%. And this is unprecedented in the post-World War history. So for, for the entire period after World War II, for the first time, world economy as a whole contracted in absolute term. And even though by 2008 it's expected that there would be some recovery, still the growth rate would be relatively slow. Can we move to the next slide? Okay, this graph shows the uh, profit rate for the US corporate sector now, uh, we know that the capitalist economy is an economy based on production for profit. So profit rate is a very important indicator for the capitalist economy. So if we look at, for example, uh, that was in the, uh, during the time of the Great Depression. So we have this trough of the profit rate. And from the 1940s all the way to 1960s, that was a time of relatively rapid, uh, relatively high profit rates. That's also the time when capitalism was undergoing some important social reform, and therefore, con uh, 
installing the institutional structure that created conditions for the so-called golden age. And when the uh, internal social contradictions of capitalism were relatively tamed, but after the peak of the 1960s, from the mid 1960s to early 1980s, we saw this sustained decline of the profit rate. And uh, many of them would still know that very well. That was period when the capitalism system as a whole, not just in the US, experienced sustained political and economic instability. Uh, and in response to that crisis, it was followed by the so-called New Liberal Era. And you see that in New Liberal Era, because of the attack of the capitalist class and the working class, you have this revival of profit rate, which continued until the early 2000s. Now, the interesting question we want to ask is whether this crisis would mark the beginning of another period of sustained decline of profit rate for the US and global capitalist economy. And will that in turn represent the beginning of another period of sustained, prolonged instability in the entire world capitalist system? Uh, please. So, now to think about the, uh, what is going to be the implication of the current crisis, there are several different possibilities. And the one possibility, after this current crisis, and soon things would just return to normal from the point of view of global capitalism. And so we would have uh, reconstruction of the normal order, normal economic order for global neoliberalism. A second possibility is that things will not simply move back to normal. Instead, there will be important change but this important change, however, will take place within the historical framework of capitalism. So that we would have some kind of social and economic reform within capitalism. In a way, it's the capitalism's self-correction. And uh, to some extent, that is uh, basically uh, much of the world's social democratic left, or uh, liberal left, is hoping for at this point they are hoping for a kind of new global new deal, which would result in some kind of reform of capitalism and result in some kind of more benign, better or more humanitarian capitalism. That's a certain possibility. The third possibility is that the current crisis would only mark the beginning of the entirely new historical era. And this new historical era will be unlike all the previous historical eras under capitalism, in the sense that it will represent not simply a, the transition from one stage of capitalism to the next stage. Instead, it will, will represent the beginning of the structural crisis of capitalism as a historical system as a whole, so that the eventual resolution of this contradiction would either have to involve a new social system to replace the existing social system, or possibly that if humanity could not liberate itself from the exploitation of capitalism, then capitalism might destroy humanity. Yes, please. OK, so to consider which of these three possibilities is more likely, let's first go over some of the previous historical experience. Now, in terms of the major crisis that undermine the existing institutional structure of capitalism, this kind of crisis happened twice over the 20th century. Uh, we know that over the period from 1914 to 1945, the capitalist system as a whole experienced a major crisis. There was the Great Depression. There were two world wars. Now, in response to that, capitalism underwent some major institutional transformations. And first of all, after World War II, the United States became the indisputable hegemony of the capitalist world system. And as the US became the hegemonic power, 
capitalist world system was restructured under the U.S. leadership. And moreover, after the Great Depression, the free market capital system of the 19th century was discredited, was discredited. And so there were important change in capitalist economic institutions. Uh, Keynesian macro macroeconomic policy became the standard practice. There were major increase in the size of government in the advanced capitalist countries. So for example, in the case of US, the size of federal government increased from about 5% of GDP before the Great Depression to about 20% of GDP after World War II. And on the other hand, uh, within the advanced capitalist countries, there were also major adjustment in relations between different social classes. The capitalist classes made some significant concessions to the working class, and so that there were new institutions like welfare state. There were some programs of income redistribution. On the global scale, uh, under the U.S. hegemony, there was some space for the periphery and the semi-periphery to pursue national economic development. So for example, the import substitution industrialization programs in Latin America and some other parts of the world, uh, socialist industrialization programs uh, in the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe. So all of these institutional conditions together created conditions for the so-called golden age, the rapid growth of the global economy. And over those years, to some extent, the working classes, especially those in the advanced capitalist countries, also enjoyed some improvement in living standards. Uh, yes. OK, however, uh, despite the seeming success of capitalism, by the mid-1960s, uh, many of you uh, are quite familiar with this part of history. And uh, new crises emerged. Uh, sustained expansion of global capitalism in combination with the presence of some of the social reform programs tended to strengthen the bargaining power of working classes. So by the mid-1960s, there was uh, again surge of working class militancies in many parts of the world. And so that was the uh, sustained widespread decline of the profit rate across the capitalist world. And as a result, there was accumulation crisis in the 1970s. And not only there was accumulation crisis, since the mid-1960s, the capitalist world had been hit by a wave of uh, revolutionary challenges. And so that uh, the entire capital world system was quite unstable from the mid-1960s to the 1970s. Uh, can we have the next slide? Okay. In response to this crisis situation, the global capitalist class organized basically organized a counter offensive, which started with the uh, fascist coup in Chile, uh, which overthrew the socialist government. And uh, after that, there was the first monetarist experiment, which implemented the new liberal uh, economic policies on a full scale. Then in 1976, there was the counter-revolution coup in China, where the radic radical Maoist leaders were arrested. And then in effect, the bureaucratic capitalist class took over political power in China. And then of course, uh, by 79 to 80, uh, Thatcher came to power in Britain, and Reagan came to power in uh, the US, so that new liberalism replaced Keynesianism, became the new econ economic orthodox. And then all of this culminated in the so-called fall of Berlin War in 1989, at a time when the entire uh, global capitalist class was celebrating the so-called end of history. And of course, uh, this year, uh, the global capitalist class is again uh, celebrating the uh, to some extent, in a desperate manner, uh, celebrate the 20th uh, anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And, uh, but uh, on the contrary to what they claim, instead of introducing in the new era of freedom and democracy, the fall of the Berlin Wall actually uh, represented the beginning of the 
uh, beginning of a new new liberal dark age and the triumph of a global new liberal uh, counter revolution. Uh, yes, please. Okay, so, and when we now think about new liberalism, of course, in effect, new liberal new, li new liberalism is a program for global capitalist class to roll back or undermine some of the social and the political gains of the global working classes that were won in the previous decades. Now, with the intention to restore the global profit rate and therefore to uh, re-establish the conditions for global capital accumulation. And in this respect, uh, the Chinese capitalism actually has played a pivotal role in this uh, global new liberal uh, counter-revolution. Yes. Now, yeah, as far as China is concerned, uh, soon after the uh, Chinese uh, bureaucratic capitalist class took over the political power, the people's communes were dismantled, which in turn created conditions uh, for the uh, Chinese and foreign capitalists to exploit the hundreds of uh, millions of workers from China's rural areas. And moreover, by the 1990s, there was the massive privatization in the urban sector as well. And overall, as a result of China's capitalist development and China's uh, incorporation in the, into the global capital market, hundreds of millions of Chinese workers were incorporated into the global market, which in turn constituted a global reserve army of cheap labor force. And because of this massive expansion of the global reserve army of cheap labor force, that in turn has the effect of dramatically undermine the bargaining power of the workers in the rest of the world. And so in that sense, China's participation in the global capital market plays a very important role in this entire new liberal scheme. Uh, can we have the next slide? Now, uh, new liberalism, of course, by now, its contradiction has become uh, quite obvious. And on the one hand, under new liberalism, exactly because of the effects of this new liberal policy, there has been dramatic increase in global inequality, and in many parts of the world, absolute declines of living standards for the working people. And so that has the effect, from a capitalist point of view, that has the effect of uh, depressing the mass consumption on the global scale. On the other hand, with the introduction of new cheap labor force in areas like China, India, Russia, Eastern Europe, and so that has, there has been dramatic increase in global industrial production capacity. So on the one hand, you have an increase in industrial production capacity. On the other hand, mass consumption is depressed so that you have the classical situation of underconsumption over production. Now that contradiction has been to some extent alleviated by the expansion of consumption in the US. But of course, the American working class has also been suffering from declining living standards, declining real wage. And so what has been sustaining the increasing consumption in the US, not surprisingly, the, the ever larger scale of household debt. And of course, this kind of debt finance consumption cannot be sustained forever. And eventually, when it cannot be sustained, we have got our current crisis. Uh, yes, next slide. Uh, is this the? Okay. Uh, now, back to the question we talked about earlier, and what is likely to be the outcome of this current crisis? Are we going to return to the normal condition of neoliberalism? Or are we going to have a, some kind of new global new deal, a construction of a global new Keynesian structure? Or instead, are we talking about a new terminal fatal crisis of capitalism? Now, I'm going to talk about this uh, one by one. But first, let's talk about the possibility of meaningful social reform under the conditions of today's global capitalism. Now, I would say, Today's global capitalism is fundamentally different from the capitalism that prevailed in 1945 for three fundamental reasons. First of all, back to 1945, 
The American hegemony was the indisputable hegemonic power in the capitalist world system, and uh, uh, the American imperialism was able to use its power and also had a sufficient willingness to pursue uh, the restructuring of global capitalism and in a way that both enhances the interest of American imperialism and the long-term interest of global capitalism. Today, we are in a fundamentally different situation. The American imperialism is in irreversible decline. On the other hand, no other big power, including China, would be able to replace the US to become the next effective hegemonic power. And as a result, in the future, in the coming decades, we are going to deal with a situation where the capitalist world system will no longer have any effective leadership. Secondly, back to 1945, uh, there was still some space for capitalism to pursue social reform. There was still some place for the capitalist class to make a compromise with the working class. But by now, we have already exhausted the historical space of social reform within capitalism. Thirdly, back to 1945, there was still very abundant space for pollution, very abundant resources to be further exploited by the global capitalism. But by now, we have already reached a point where the global ecological system is basically on the verge of total collapse. For these three fundamental reasons, I think a return to the 1945 situation or re return to, the, uh, to a situation of capitalism with social reform is historically impossible given today's uh, historical context. Uh, yes, please. Okay, so how about uh, rebuilding the neoliberal global economy? Okay. If we consider what is likely to happen to the global economy in the next, say, 5, 10, maybe 15 years. Now, before the crisis, the basic problem was that, on the one hand, you had overproduction, which resulted from the rapid expansion of the so-called emerging markets. On the other hand, you have got global underconsumption. And uh, this dilemma was solved to some extent by the debt finance consumption in the US. So the question is, after the crisis, if we want to rebuild the global capitalist economy, now from the capitalist point of view, what major source of effective demand and that is going to be provided to this global capitalist economy. Uh, you can no longer count on the American households to take on more and more debt. Okay. Now, there are basically two possible scenarios. Under one possible scenario, suppose the US will engage in an aggressive Keynesian expans expansionary policy. And uh, uh, that, I don't think that is very likely to happen. Okay? But suppose the Obama administration finally made up some determination to move in socially and economically progressive direction. What will happen? Now, in that case, instead of having a debt finance private consumption to lead the global expansion, we probably would have a situation where we would have the deficit financed American government spending to lead the global ex expansion. Okay. So we are going to have expansion of American uh, government deficit, increase in government spending. The government spending increase in turn would lead to the increase in uh, the uh, spending in the economy as a whole. That possibly would create the conditions for Asian economies and especially the Chinese economy to sustain export-led growth. So basically, we would reproduce the conditions before the crisis, except in this case, the engine for the global effective demand is not the private consumption in the US, but deficit finance government spending in the US. 
But if that is the case, it probably will not take very long before we see a situation where you have the total collapse of US dollar, the total collapse of US treasury bonds, and that in turn lead to another collapse of the global economy. Okay. So that is one possible scenario. Uh, can we move to the next slide? Okay. Uh, all right, so this is basically a, a comparison of the historical U.S. federal government uh, debt as a percentage of GDP relative to the projected uh, U.S. federal government debt. Now, historically, as you can see here, uh, during World War II, the U.S. federal government debt uh, reached a peak which was greater than 100%. And over the post-war years, uh, for the most years, the debt to GDP ratio tended to fall until the 1970s. That increased again during the uh, Reagan years. And then after the current crisis, it's going to be here. And we are going to have a surge in the debt to GDP ratio. And if these trends continues, based on that uh, Congressional Budget Office uh, projection, if these trends continue uh, by 2020, it will be greater than 100%, in other words, exceeding the peak, previous peak in World War II. What is that based upon, the red line? The red line based upon, uh, that is the projected federal government based debt. Based what? What, what, what? <laughs> 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 I think that's not the, the, the presentation go to the end. Maybe we'll have plenty of time for questions. Right, I will sure, I will come back to address we'll that. <laughs> and uh, uh, then, uh, based on this projection, again, and uh, before the mid 21st century, and uh, the, the debt to GDP ratio could go up to 300% of GDP. Okay, yes, uh, next slide. Yeah. Okay, so if that scenario could not work out, and uh, how about some alternative scenario? The alternative scenario, of course, the second largest economy in the world, me measured by the purchasing power parity right now, uh, is China. And uh, uh, the uh, alternative scenario is that instead of having the US to lead the global economic expansion, how about having China to lead the global economic expansion? The question is, how would China do that? Now, ideally, you might think about a situation that the Chinese capital class would be voluntarily uh, giving up some of the wealth and income that they have gained, and so that there would be some kind of redistribution within China. And under that conditions, China's income growth would be led not by exports, but by domestic consumption. And with the China's economy led by domestic consumption, China could in turn serve as an engine for the global economy as a whole. Uh, in reality, of course, that is unlikely to happen. Uh, most likely, uh, we are not going to see any significant income redistribution within China. On the other hand, in the coming years, China could no longer rely upon exports to lead economic expansion. So that basically leaves investment as the only engine of the economy. But China has already got very high level of investment ratios. And so if China were to rely upon investment led economic growth, and uh, in the not very distant future, we are going to expect a situation where China is going to suffer from uh, very high level investment, therefore massive excess production capacity. And that could in turn translate into income crisis for China and the global economy as a whole. Yes, please. Yes, oh, it's there, okay. Uh, thanks. <laughs> uh, okay, so now it's interesting to see uh, these comments by Wolfgang, uh, Wolfgang Manchu, who is a columnist for the Financial Times, the British uh, newspaper, Financial Times. 
And so in, on October 19th, and he had this comment, which basically says that the current monetary fiscal policies of all of these capital governments have already created a new set of asset bubbles. And this new set of asset bubbles, and either they will burst soon, or if the uh, central banks and capital governments attempt to sustain these bubbles, and it may, may in turn lead to another round of depression in the not very distant future. Uh, yes. Okay. Now, another factor that could independently interact with the, uh, China, either the China-led global growth scenario or the US-led growth, uh, growth uh, scenario that I talked about earlier has to do with the, the peak oil phenomena. That is, there is a growing body of evidence suggests that the global oil production either has already reached the peak level in its entire history lifetime or may reach this point very soon. And of course, uh, oil is uh, uh, quite uh, important energy resource for the global capitalist economy, and which accounts for about 35% of global energy supply and more than 90% of all of the transportation energy in the world. And moreover, there will be no easy substitute for oil. Uh, Biofuels, for example, use very large amount of land and water and of course would compete with uh, people's uh, demand for food in a world where we have more than one billion, one billion people who suffer from hungry. And uh, electricity, uh, first of all there's a question about uh, what fuel do we use to make electricity. And secondly, in many cases electricity cannot substitute oil. For example, in the for, in terms of the fuel for airplanes, the fuel for ships, the fuel for trucks or some heavy equipment, and also obviously electricity cannot serve as chemical inputs. Only in the area of personal transportation, uh, there is some hope that electricity could replace the gasoline, but even in that area, it would require some massive infrastructure transformation. So if this global peak oil turns out to be true, and that could be independent factor that will accelerate the coming of the next global capitalist crisis. Uh, yes. Uh, I guess we skipped the one. <laughs> okay, right here. Now, now all global peak oil, of course, that is just one aspect of the depletion of natural resources. Uh, even more importantly, uh, even every aspect of the global ecological system uh, as a result of centuries of global capital accumulation uh, is quite close to the point of a total collapse. And one crucial area that many people talk about right now, of course, has to do with climate change. Now, basically, now we have this uh, consensus if uh, first of all, okay, the global average temperature now is already about 0.8 degrees Celsius uh, higher than the pre-industrial time. And moreover, it's rising at a rate of about 0.2 degrees per decade. And if global warming rises to 2 degrees, uh, there would be uh, very catastrophic consequences, including between 15 to 40 percent of the animal and plant species could go extinct, and the widespread areas in the subtropic, subtropic areas uh, would suffer from drought. And also, it could in turn, more importantly, it could in turn reach a set of tipping points, therefore resulting some set of uh, climate feedbacks that result from the oceans or land's own ecological system Therefore, the global warming potentially could get out of control of the human beings. And if the global warming reaches 4 degrees, then according to uh, James Lovelock, the, the British scientist and 
the greater part of the world would no longer be suitable for the inhabitation of human beings, and that could be a possible 90% reduction of the global population. Now, so to prevent the two degree warming, according to IPCC, that is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we need to uh, reduce the uh, uh, emissions of uh, carbon dioxide by 2050 uh, by 50 to 85 percent from 2000 levels. That is based on estimate that we need to stabilize the global uh, atmospheric concentration in the atmosphere as the, the 450 parts per million level. And but uh, according to James Hansen, the NASA scientist, and what is actually needed because of different estimate of the climate sensitivity, what is actually needed is 350 parts per million. The fact is that right now, uh, the global atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide is already close to 390 parts per million. Okay, can we have the next one? Okay, so what is the underlying cause of this uh, climate change crisis? The most important underlying cause has to do with that since about uh, 1500, 1600, capitalism emerged and later uh, expanded to include the entire globe, therefore become the first dominant global system. And under capitalism, the human economic and social system behave in ways very different from pre-capital system. In particular, capitalism is a system based on the pursuit of endless accumulation of capital. And with endless of accumulation of capital, it inevitably implies increase, uh, the depletion of natural resources and impact on the ecological system on increasingly larger scales. Uh, can we have the next one? Okay, if we look at this graph, the blue curve shows the world gross domestic product from the early 19th century until now. The black curve shows the carbon dioxide emissions from the early 19th century until now. So it's quite clear from this graph, you have this historical parallel relationship between capitalist accumulation and emissions of carbon dioxide. And now if we want to turn around this whole trend. And of course, right now, the, the world's governments, uh, some capitalist groups are going to meet in Copenhagen to negotiate a new treaty about climate stabilization. Okay. But if you want to suddenly reverse the black curve, but hoping that the blue curve could continue to skyrocket into infinity, so you can think about what's the likelihood for that to be achieved. Uh, can we have that next one? Okay. So uh, this graph, uh, the black curve shows the actual growth rate of carbon dioxide emissions from 2001 to 2009. Okay. You could see that from 2001 to 2008, when the global economy was expanding, for every year there was positive growth of carbon dioxide emission. Now this year, 2009, because of the global recession, and finally we have got the first negative change in emission in, uh, in this century. Okay, how about this uh, pink curve and the red curve? The pink curve is the uh, top one, the red curve is the uh, lower one. Now, the pink curve, if According to IPCC, to prevent two degree warming, we need to reduce the global emissions by 50 to 85 percent uh, by 2050 compared to 2000 levels. And bear in mind that, according to James Hansen, that will be far short of what is actually required. Now, based on the IPCC's 50 percent reduction re requirement, from now on until 2050, the global emission need to reduce at an average annual rate of 2% a year. Okay. And based on the 85% redu reduction requirement, that each year the emission need to fall by 
Now, if you look at the past performance of capitalist economy, now in the past, so long as the global economy is supposedly doing well, we have positive increase in emissions. Only in the current recession year, when the global economy is experiencing the deepest recession after World War II, we have got a negative change that is roughly comparable to the 50% reduction requirement. In other words, given the current pattern, given the current pattern, if the global economy were to repeat the current recession for 40 times in the coming four decades, we may be able to achieve the 50% reduction requirement. Uh, can we have the following slide? Okay. So that raises the question about uh, not only the long-term sustainability of capitalism, but really the question about and whether the humanity is going to destroy capitalism before capitalism destroys the humanity. Now that of course has to do with uh, what is likely to happen to the global class struggle in the coming decades. If we consider the uh, Western countries or the core areas of the capital world system or the historical imperialist states, uh, pretty much all of the advanced capital countries right now are faced with serious crisis, uh, fiscal crisis. Uh, according to the latest IMF projections, by about 2015, the average debt to government debt to GDP ratio in the advanced capital countries is going to rise to about 120% uh, of GDP. Now, why is this fiscal crisis? On the one hand, despite the capitalist attack in the neoliberal areas, the working classes in the Western countries have been able to fight some defensive battles. And as a result of these defensive battles, the working classes have been able to protect much of the historical social rights that were won in the earlier decades. That in combination with the demographic trend, in particular the aging of population would mean also, of course, in particular in the case of US, the very inefficient capital system of healthcare. And that would lead to secular tendency of rising pension costs and healthcare costs. And uh, under the capitalist system, that is going to translate into fiscal crisis for the capitalist state. Now, if that happens, either if that fiscal crisis is not addressed, that will lead to crisis of capital accumulation. Alternatively, if the capital class attempts to again try to overcome the fiscal crisis by undertaking more attack on the working class rights, that will raise the real question about the legitimacy of the capital system. Now, however, the most important area of the global class struggle, I think probably is not in the Western countries but in the semi-periphery. So what is in the semi-periphery? Uh, that is basically what the financial circles these days would typically call the emerging markets, like China, India, Russia, Latin America. So this is the area that in now includes the great majority of the world population, and also soon will include probably more than half of the global income output and also, this is an area where the global industrial production, global capital accumulation is concentrated. On the other hand, uh, if we think about Latin America, Russia, or Eastern Europe, and these are the areas where uh, <coughs> historically some relatively large industrial working class had already been formed. In China and India, these are the areas where large industrial working class is taking place. However, the workers in these areas are also suffering from some of the most intense capitalist exploitation in the world. But given the character of the capitalism in these areas, 
the campus in classes in this area will not be able to install institutions like welfare state to accommodate the growing political and economic demands of working class in these areas. And also, these are also the economies that heavily depend on exports, either manufacturing or raw materials to the advanced capitalist countries, and that can no longer be sustained. Moreover, these are also the areas that are character characterized by relatively resource and energy intensive production processes. Therefore, this will be the area where the global ecological con contradictions will be concentrated. So the center periphery is likely to be the area where economic, social, and ecological contradictions will converge in the coming decades. And that could in turn pre create conditions and so that in the coming decades we could see the rise of wave revolutions in these areas. And if the revolutions in the center periphery could end up with the victory of the working class, that could in turn turn the global balance of power decisively to the favor of the exploited and oppressed in the world. So I will stop here and I will be happy to address your questions. Okay, my name is Irving Lee. I, this is the first time I've heard your presentation and I'm not familiar with your work, but I, I am interested in what's going on in terms of of uh, Chinese Communist Party policy, specifically what they're trying to do. Obviously, there's been a lot of big brouhaha on uh, their economic uh, development programs in Africa uh -huh. and Latin America. And uh -huh. I want your, your comments on that, whether they play a positive alternative role to Western economic development. And the other question is, in terms of internal development, whether the Chinese Communist Party has plans, plan B, of course, is I guess internal consumption, but whether there is a plan C in case that doesn't work out, is nationalizations and planned economy still a factor? Is that still something they can, is that still talked about within the party as, as a possibility if there's a severe economic crisis? Uh -huh. uh, very good questions. First of all, uh, let me try to address your second question first. First of all, right now, uh, I don't think uh, the elites within the Chinese Communist Party uh, believe that they are likely to be hit by a serious crisis in the near future. Uh, there's found some discussions about promoting domestic demand, and uh, but until today that have been limited to some measures uh, that so far have not accomplished anything very significant. There have been efforts, for example, to increase uh, the so-called, or uh, it's more like restore, the cooperative medical care insurance program in the countryside. And, uh, but in terms of its real effect, first of all, it has little effect in increasing the person's uh, actual person's power. And also because the medical market has very much privatized in China. And uh, so that uh, the private doctors, they have many ways to deal with the government policy. So for example, uh, if a peasant goes to a doctor, if he is going to pay out of his own pocket, it's going to be, say, 100 yuan. And if he is going to be paid, he is going to use the cooperative insurance program, and the doctor is going to charge him uh, 200 yuan. And so that has no real effect uh, for, for, for the uh, actual improvement of the peasant's conditions. And so in reality, the China's economic growth right now has been sustained by increasing larger scale of investment and much of that goes to the real estate sector. Now regarding your first uh, question, and uh, I have not followed about the China's investment in Africa or other areas in detail, but clearly, first of all, I have no doubt that uh, China has completed its transition to capitalism long ago. And so it's one of the, right now, one of the rising emerging capitalist power in the global market. And of course, uh, because China specializes in manufacturing exports, and uh, it has a disadvantage that it has to rely upon the US as the export market. But on the other hand, it has to rely upon other parts of the world 
for resources and energy, that of course creates uh, the pressure of competition for resources and energy with other capitalist powers in the rest of the world. Now that by itself, I don't see anything progressive unless in the sense that uh, to the extent give the, China gives Africa one more choice of capital power, maybe on the margin, it improves the bargaining leverage of the uh, African countries. Okay, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, I want um, to ask you to elaborate on uh, your sort of skepticism about the possibility of uh, reforms within capitalism. Yes. You think, uh, you said that you think the potential for reform has been exhausted in general and uh, in rich countries in particular, so my question is why? On a similar note, why do you think that there is no, um, that income redistribution within China is unlikely? And similarly, why do you think that uh, in general a wel welfare state in the semi-periphery is unlikely? Okay, thanks. Uh, well, let's think about why, let's say, back to the mid-20th century, it's possible for a group of capital countries, the Western countries, to engage in programs of social reform. I think basically for two reasons. Why is that is basically the uh, Lenin's argument that is the reason that, that Western countries can offer some program of social reform is because these countries occupy monopolistic positions in the capitalist global division of labor that allow them to acquire a disproportionate share of the global value added. That, however, is in effect based on the exploitation of cheap labor in the rest of the world. And, uh, but in the future, and we are going to have not only the Western workers that are going to defend their history of rights, but also the workers in China, in India, and uh, in other parts of the world, they were also demanding a growing range of economic political rights. So it's no longer possible for the capitalists to exploit part of the world while using the super profits to redistribute, redistribute within small number of countries. That's one reason. The second reason is that back to 1945, and as I said earlier, there was still ample space for uh, resource depletion, pollution, and so, in other words, there was still possibility for huge growth of global economy. But now we have basically reached the limit of growth, and that is no longer possible anymore. In uh, dealing with China and the U.S., in the statistic on a statistical basis of development, and the movement of capital, et cetera, uh, there's no room for a parallel discussion about what is actually happening in China that is not within the scope of the statistics that apply to a capitalist country. I mean, for instance, the question of social capital, which Marx doesn't write about because it didn't exist at that time, the, the existence of social capital is capital in the hands of the government, whether it's capitalist or socialist, which can be used for social purposes or for private purposes. We gave a couple of a trillion dollars back to the taxpayers, uh, who are the 1% of the population. But what is happening to the social capital in China at the present time? That's question number one. Question number two is, do you see any difference between the development of capitalistic forms in China in the 1990s, Gong Ho with, with Jiang Jimin, and what has happened since 2003 or 2005 when they have changed some uh, uh, directions in their own country with new types of laws and re regulations? Not that they haven't made, uh, had problems, not that they haven't planned well and remained tied up too much to Western uh, uh, capital, uh, and particularly the United States. However, they have planning overall. How does that affect what they are doing? And how does that differentiate them from where the world is going for a capitalist class that has ceased to develop the forces of production and lost its right to do it? And 
Take the foreign policy of China again. Give it another thought. What, what relations are they creating in Africa, uh, uh, South America uh, in particular, uh, where they are, they are on the basis of e equal relationships and not taking the capitalistic approach to uh, using the former colonial countries. So I'd like to know what you think of the way they have handled the economic crisis with their trillions of dollars and how we have handled the economic crisis. I put it simply, we started from the top down. They started from the bottom up and by 1910, I mean 2010, my God, I'm 100 years back, by 2010, they're expected to be out of the crisis in terms of the labor in their country, where we're first going into it very heavily. So how can you link them together so fully without seeing the difference? Well, first of all, I personally I don't see uh, how one could put social and capital, these two words together. Mm. And uh, of course, uh, we may be able to talk about state capital. And uh, as far as state capital is concerned, I think even back to the time of Friedrich Engels, and he already talked about that we could not equate the state ownership and the Bismarck as socialism. And uh, uh, even by this narrow definition, uh, China's state ownership as a share of the industrial sector, uh, probably by now already fall below 20%. And uh, certainly, and one cannot regard a country with millions of sweatshops as a socialism. Uh, there are differences between the uh, Chinese economic policy under the previous president uh, Jiang Zemin and under the current uh, Hu Jintao and uh, uh, Wen Jiabao government. And there have been some minor uh, adjustments in terms of uh, discourse. The current government talks about so-called scientific development view or scientific development perspective or harmonious society. And, uh, uh, but uh, in terms of their uh, actual actions, as I explained earlier, this has not contributed to, uh, not to say, uh, reverse, and not even significantly slow down the increase in income inequality. And uh, uh, regarding planning, and in fact, uh, China no longer uh, called uh, five-year plans as plans, and uh, the former State Planning Commission now has been renamed as State Development and Reform Commissions, and so I don't see any planning that is remaining in that context. And of course, and uh, uh, that does not mean the state would stop from intervening with the capitalist economy, and that, of, on the other hand, uh, it's just what every other capital state has to do when you run into capitalist crisis. So when you're a college student in the 80s, uh, neoclassical economics was the dominant, uh, most fashionable ideology of the right. time. Right. Do you know what it's like now? Has the uh, Asian financial crisis, the current crisis, uh -huh. Uh -huh. The ecological crisis affected? Uh -huh. uh, what's the most fashionable or, or dominant? Well, neoclassical economics is still the dominant, the most fashionable for economics students. That's very unfortunate. But outside economics, and since 1990s, there has been gradual and increasingly uh, substantial increase in the leftist influence in China. And so uh, more and more uh, intellectuals, including young students, now have become interested in leftist ideas. And many of them have studied China's past revolutionary history by themselves, and because neither the Chinese government or the Western main mainstream media could provide uh, the, the, the version about the Chinese history that is from the working people's point of view. And so many of them have rediscovered China's own revolutionary history. And so that the Maoist ideas, and because in China, Maoism is the, the China's revolution legacy, Maoist <laughs> ideas uh, have gained a very large influence uh, among many of these uh, young people. And I would say that China is probably 
uh, one of the areas, and these days you can see the most rapid growth of the left in the world. Um, yeah, uh, I've got a question about this relationship in positive between this parallel relationship between GDP and carbon emissions. Um, GDP, as I understand it, is used to define the sum value of all human economic activity. Um, and you're right, in a fossil fuel-based economy, almost everything we have, you know, the plastic in the you know, shopping bags we buy, the you know, fuel in our car engines, it's all predicated on a fossil fuel-like base. But um, that might not necessarily be the case with technological innovation. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like you know, the value of human economic activity is socially constructed. We, def we are the ones who define how much like what we make or what we do is worth. So I just feel like perhaps without the benefit of powerful fossil fuels, our GDP might not grow as, like global GDP might not grow as quickly. Mm -hmm. But I mean, Marx said that since value is the surplus, I mean, um, increasing profitability is extracted from the surplus value of labor. Uh -huh. um, human labor is all that's needed, you know? We don't necessarily need fossil fuel assisted labor to have GDP growth, do we? I mean, can we have, didn't the GDP grow in some small way through like artisans or whatever, through just sheer human labor power before the advent of the fossil fuels? Right. Now I guess that's something I guess the uh, shares much of the concern of the general public. Now at a very fundamental level, that is, uh, all human activities, material activities, inevitably will have some impact on the environment. And since it's not possible uh, to reduce our environmental impact to zero, if you want to expand this activity infinitely, and sooner or later you are going to reach the limit, you are going to undermine the sustainability of the environment. And uh, that was historically, for much of the human history, that was not the case. This kind of explosive growth of human material activity has been a unique phenomenon under capitalism because it's a system based on the, this endless accumulation of capital. Now, regarding the role of technology, now technology may, within some limit, help us to address certain environmental problems. But on the other hand, of course, we all know that human knowledge is also limited. And we know something about nature, and there will always be something that we don't know. So while technology could help us to address some problems, we don't know what could possible be the side effects in other areas of environmental impact. So for example, as far as the fossil fuel is concerned, and when we start to use fossil fuels 200 years ago, it seems it's a very wonderful technology. Who knew at the time that after 200 years it could threaten the survival of human beings? Now, in addition to that, there's also one additional institutional structure about capitalism that makes environmental solution under capitalism impossible, even if we have a perfect technology solution. That is because capitalism is a system based on nation states. And since it's a system based on nation state, each state would compete with each other to pursue their respective capital accumulation. So right now, in the, we have this Copenhagen uh, climate negotiation, right? But now all the major power is willing to give up their own capital accumulation in order to save the climate. Uh, China, India talk about the right of development. I don't think the Chinese government or Indian government really care about the right of development of Chinese people, Indian people. What they really care about is this rate of accumulation of Chinese capital, Indian capital. But because of this structure, and each state compete with each other, so there's no hope for us to have a global solution of this global environmental problem. Mm. Okay. Yes. I want to ask you, uh, do you see any role playing any of the new wave of community-owned uh, utilities like in Mexico, they have the, the utilities, the wind farms in, uh, uh -huh. in Brazil, in, uh, or Netherlands, or any of those uh, worker, workers' own factories in Argentina, do you see any you know, major play? I mean, I mean 
as a trend, you know, developing it, which doesn't play any role with the Keynesian system or Adam Smith system and doesn't care about any growth of economic, you know, interest rates, which are not profit. And the banking industry, which is non-profit. I'm not too familiar with the kind of experiment, experiments you talk about. I know that, uh, for example, in Venezuela, uh, under Chavez, there are some efforts to, to organize the community, to pursue cooperation at the community level. And in fact, in China, even after the official dismantling of the people's communes, there are some areas that continue to maintain uh, commune or cooperative style agricultural organization. Uh, it's reported that there are tens of thousands of them. And uh, it's actually a small proportion of the large number of communities in China. But since China is a large country, so you get this large number. Uh, but uh, my own feeling is that these efforts, experiments, definitely would be important and helpful. But if we really want to fundamentally transform the condition of life for the great majority of people, and we have to uh, not only work on local efforts, but also uh, work towards the fundamental transformation of the social system, as a first step to overthrow the political and economic power of the capitalist class. Yes. Uh, a few weeks ago, I read this article saying that China, Japan, France, all producing country, and even Japan would go leave their dollar reserves uh, and go for some common currency. Is this just a rumor? And they were saying to do this in. To, uh, they've been talking about this forever, but in this they said that they would do it actually around 2018. Uh -huh. Is uh -huh. this just a rumor or...? That's hard to say. It's a the rumor. question has to do with that some times ago there was this report that China, India, Japan and some mm -hmm. other countries are conspiring to switch their foreign exchange reserves away from the US dollar, maybe by 2018. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, now, uh, once in a while you have these kind of rumors, and uh, it is difficult to, to tell you know, how serious that is. Uh, what is most likely is that for some countries, smaller countries like in India, Russia, that may be half true, half false. Uh, half true, half false. For China, my feeling is that there's no serious intention at this point to actually dump the US dollar. Okay. And uh, so China has in fact become a very important supporter of the uh, US global power, including its financial power. So the, in effect, uh, the Chinese renminbi is right now backing the uh, US dollar. Of course, that does not mean the US dollar can be, its current power can be sustained forever. Uh, what could possibly happen is, uh, is a combination of the U.S. fiscal deficit and the uh, decline of oil production, the surge of oil prices could fundamental, <coughs> fundamentally change this situation that at one point could either force the U.S. to dramatically increase interest rate or force the China to abandon the link between renminbi and the U.S. dollar. Uh, Following up on the same point, uh, there's been a tendency in uh, U.S. financial circles to wax enthusiastic about the uh, alleged linkage between the U.S. and Chinese economy. For instance, this conservative historian Neil Ferguson uses the term Chimerica to describe uh -huh. what he calls the new reality, <laughs> right. and in which there is an, an, an ever-growing interdependence on the Chinese side for access to the U.S. export market, and, and the Chinese are willing to do whatever it takes to maintain that. And on the American side, dependence on the Chinese to go on buying and buying and buying and buying U.S. Right. securities. To what extent do you think that this actually, that this kind of interweaving and interdependence actually does exist, or to what extent is it an ideological manufacturer? And, and if it does exist, it would, you know, if you could just elaborate a bit further on what you just said about this problem about the dollar reserves in China, is it really in the long-term interest of the Chinese to keep up 
trillions upon trillions of dollars that are subject to devaluation by U.S. fiscal policy. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and as a footnote to that, uh, in Yahoo Finance this week, I saw something about the extent of indebtedness of the Chinese government with particular reference to the Chinese provinces. I was quite shocked to see this because it, it made the claim that the, compared to the, relative to the size of the Chinese economy, China is more indebted than the U.S. Anyway, I wonder if you could also comment about that too. Well, it's, uh, uh, first, regarding the simpler last question, uh, I, I'm not aware of the statistics, but based on my intuition, uh, if that is indeed the case, uh, I would not expect that to be uh, an immediate concern in the sense that probably the local government's debt would be the assets of some of the Chinese private citizens. And those people may happen to be the same people who control the government. Uh, so. Now, regarding the more substantial question uh, about Chimerica, uh, that of course is a very attractive hypothesis, especially before the current crisis. Now, I will say that uh, if just assume we have a progressive socialist government in China, now that is not a concern at all. And there's no interest at all for China to maintain this kind of relationship where uh, China would use its own cheap labor to produce manufacturers in exchange for some dollars to relent to the US to spend either for consumption or to fight war in, in, in Afghanistan, right? Yeah. And, but since we don't have a progressive socialist government, it's another question. Now, I would say uh, there are probably several levels uh, involved here. At one level, there's indeed an immediate interest for the Chinese capitalism, given that it's a uh, caps model based on the exports uh, with exportation of cheap labor. Certainly, large section of Chinese ruling elites, even today, still probably maintain some confidence in American capitalism. And thirdly, I suspect, I don't have hard evidence, but I suspect some level of co corruption is also involved. And because there are many uh, rumors or lots of anecdotal evidence that suggest that many Chinese officials would have part of their assets invested in the US, buying houses in the US, having their relatives move to the US, having their children going to school in the US. And uh, so that, that may be the real thing behind the Chimerica. And uh, then regarding whether this kind of Chimerica could be sustained, um, now, uh, first of all, uh, in the past, the US was able to provide this export market for China and other Asian countries. In the future, increasingly, this will, not be able to, uh, this will not be possible, unless in the form of massive increase in government deficit, that will not be sustainable in, in any case. And uh, on the other hand, in the future, China will depend more and more on resource and energy imports and that would be something that the U.S. will not be able to provide. Uh, I, I suspect that if things continue in its current form in the future, more and more global trade surpluses would no longer be concentrated in the hands of Asian manufacturing exporters. And, but more and more would be concentrated in the oil exporters. And if that is the case, the oil exporters will have much less incentive to keep their reserve in the form of dollar. So that may be very bad news for the US dollar. Now let me very quickly say that the, uh, my understanding is in contradiction to the prediction of IMF about what's going to happen in the coming years. IMF right now is predicting that China's trade surplus will continue to widen in the coming years. So in a few years, and we will see you know, how the reality evolves. Are there people who have had their hands up and have been waiting? And uh, what's... I uh, just don't forget to come up back here for Sam. Oh, oh, this is uh, Minchi's book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll do commercials. We'll do a big round of commercials <laughs> at the very end. Okay, yeah.
Thanks for such an informative presentation. Uh, just a brief question. I was wondering if you could comment on um, your thoughts about the prospect in the medium term for real growth rate, uh, or real wage growth rate for the Chinese working class. And I guess in due course, the paradox that the Chinese state is going to face when they simultaneously have to keep um, an export-driven economy with, with a devalued currency, but also face the prospect of an uprising on behalf of the working class as well. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a <laughs> uh, about, first of all, statistical question. Uh, that's a very difficult question. Uh, because the Chinese government does not publish wage data for the whole section of workers. We only have limited data for the workers' wage in the formal sector. And uh, that, of course, includes everyone from the government employees to CEOs. And that number does show the wage have continued to grow. But even that number would show that the wage have grown at a small, slower, slower pace than the overall economy. Now, for the workers in the informal sector, or for the migrant workers, those who had their origin in the countryside and work in the cities, uh, the anecdotal evidence would suggest that if you compare the 2005, let's say, manufacturing workers' wage with what's typical in the 1990s, uh, it's often reported that there was no increase in nominal wage. So real wage was likely to have declined. Now in 2006, 2007, because of the global economy boom, there was indeed some increase in wage. And then you have the crisis, and then tens of millions of workers lost, lost their jobs, so I guess to some extent back to the 2005 position. Now looking ahead, uh, Will China face a workers' uprising uh, some years ahead? Uh, in the 1990s, uh, when there was massive privatization in the urban sector, uh, it's the state, state sector workers that suffer the most. And uh, in response to that, of course, there have been resistance, there have been protests, but nevertheless, pro, uh, privatization continued. But over the years, the former state sector workers had gained the political experience, and some of them now actually have developed the comparatively high level of class consciousness. And uh, so that uh, we are talking about the working class that had both the experience in the socialist period and the experience in the capitalist period. <coughs> And uh, many of them have continued to organize resistance. And by this year, we started to see some uh, tentative changes. So for example, in July this year, in the northeast part of China, uh, there was a massive workers' protest. A capitalist was beaten to death in that protest. Now that is very significant in China, because for so many years capitalists have got so much power, so in reality, in real life, it's very easy for a capitalist, let's say, to uh, hurt a worker or to kill a worker without actually suffering any punishment. Okay? So this is very significant, and it actually forced the government to temporarily suspend the privatization program in the steel industry. And on the other hand, uh, the majority of the Chinese workers are now are the migrant workers. The migrant workers, because they came from countryside, they have got comparatively low class consciousness. And of course, they have had to struggle with survival. They suffer very, very horrible exploitation. And so their class consciousness developed relatively slowly. But for them, the conditions are also changing or will change in the future. There are a number of factors. Why is that uh, now some of the Chinese uh, journalism start to talk about second generation migrant workers? These second generation migrant workers, they grew up in the cities. They, they no longer go back to the countryside. So their expectations are different from the first generation migrant workers. They expect to have the same kind of living standards, same kind of rights of the urban residents, but yet they cannot get it. 
Now, another potentially dangerous factor is that for those first generation migrant workers, and uh, some of them by now have reached retirement age, yet they are not covered by any pensions, not covered by any healthcare programs, and some of them are physically disabled. They return to countryside, and, but have no way to support their own life. And so that would be a potential explosion point. And so if in the future, the Chinese workers in the traditional sector could develop an effective way to unite, to develop solidarity with the migrant workers, that would be a very formidable political force. From a global point of view, what pathways do you see for the development of a truly international uh, workers' movement and one that is fused with a, an international environmental movement? Like some years ago, we had the demonstration with the Teamsters and Turtles together, which is a brief glimmer of that. But what pathways do you think could, could lead to that? A uh, very important question, but I'm afraid I cannot offer uh, any immediate pathway. I guess the, probably the best pathway will emerge from the actual struggle of the environment movement and the actual struggle of the uh, working class movement. Uh, I think last year there was a book I cannot, it's too bad that I cannot remember either the author's name or the book's name. Uh, he was the dean of the uh, Yale College of uh, for Forestry and Environment Management. Speth, right, 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 yeah. So the, the, that was a long time uh, conventional environmental activist and also in the academia, also had served as advisor for the Carter administration. But now he has convinced that capitalism could no longer solve the environmental problem. And what we need is some form of socialism that is not based on the endless accumulation of capital. So that is some, uh, I think, uh, hopeful side. There's a question back here, so, um, what do you think are the prospects for some sort of global Malthusian bloodletting as a response to this situation? Large scale mobilization in, like, in combat, basically. Because I feel like capitalism uses warfare as a kind of exhaust valve. So, perhaps some kind of huge, like, a world war scenario could let capitalism get off the hook. Because, you know, I'm, I'm speaking metaphorically here, perhaps. What I'm trying to say is, like, all these problems converge. What I see is that capitalism, the only way it could save itself is by initiating some kind of large-scale warfare. Do you think this is possible? What do you think are the reasons why it's probable or improbable? What do you think about that? Uh, about the scenario we talk about, there is, uh, I would say, there's a real possibility. Uh, I don't think capitalism can actually get away in that form, but maybe in the sense that the existing ruling elites could pursue another form of exploitative, oppressive social system. And uh, there is no definite necessity that uh, the possibility we talk about uh, would definitely be avoided, but that simply means you know the, 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 the effort on the part of the global exploited would be more urgent, and it's better for us to destroy capitalism before that kind of scenario materialize, and then actually wait for that kind of scenario to happen. Okay, I think that we've worked our speaker long enough. I'm sure he'd be willing to stay and uh, talk with some people individually for a little while. Uh, and on behalf of the Brecht Forum uh, and Science and Society, thank you very much. Thank you.